Welcome to Run to the Hills. This is episode 11. And we, this episode is going to be all about training. And uh, in a few minutes, we're going to have an interview that I did with Eddie and Dave Troman. And they talked about how to plan your training. So that's the come in this episode. But we thought to start with, we'd have a little chat about how our training's going for the South Downs Way. And I've got the Hardmores 55 tomorrow. So Eddie, just share a little bit about how your training's gone. Now, I know you're not probably going to be able to do the race but um how has it gone because i know you've wanted to complete your cycle of training i can hear the slight tremor in your voice john of nerves of the big <laughs> race tomorrow uh yeah we just thought uh, yeah i pulled out of the south downs way 100 i emailed james this week to say that i wasn't coming they haven't lifted the quarantine as expected and um actually there's quite a few cases now in morzine of um COVID is on the rise in France. We've just been put down on, on uh, lockdown, curfew lockdown. So we have to be inside at 9 p.m. and we're not allowed outside again until 6 a.m. It's really going to curtail my late night partying, but I'll have to get on with it. But yeah, what, this episode, we had a long chat with Dave Truman about how to plan your training block, your training cycle over the year, how to break it down. And we sort of just discussed lots of different ideas and how we made it work and we thought as we've just both finished our South Downs Way 100 training block we'd have a quick chat about what worked and maybe what we'd done differently and for this block I decided as I was never 100% sure I was actually going to get to the race that I could maybe try something a bit different I've lived out in the mountains now for five years anyone that's run in the mountains knows how different it is training than around a town or even just around flat countryside it is brutal um the running out here so there were two things i decided to do one i decided to see if i could add some more volume to my training and what that would do so normally i've been i'm very comfortable at about 10 hours of running so i work in time because there's so much vertical gain here sometimes a mile takes me like half an hour so i very rarely run to miles or kilometers so i decided to see what would happen if I added a bit more volume to my training, um, consistent volume, and see whether that over time became easier or it just made me more tired and I didn't get anything quality out of my training. And the other thing I wanted to do was really make sure my recovery running was all really, really easy, often even hiking. Um, so I sort of got that balance between the volume and then making sure that with that extra volume that the recovery running and the easy running was really super easy. So I added about three hours extra with building it up slowly of running than I normally would do. And I've held that for now um, 12-ish weeks. So I start at the end of August. And I would say I've learned that over time, I've just been really tired. I'm not sure that um, I, I've just found every run a real chore. My legs have been really stiff. Um, it's taken me longer to get into the running. Am I stronger? Am I faster? Well, the only way I really compare it is on Strava. You know, the, the Strava segments you often run. And um, I, if I give them a bit of welly, and I think, well, I'm going to give this one a little bit of welly, a longer segment. So I did that the other day, a, one that I'd run in 17 minutes uphill before, and I did it in 15 minutes something not killing myself. So I thought, well, I'm obviously strong and I'm in good shape. Did I enjoy that extra volume? Is it something that I would do again? I'm not sure. I think I've just felt really tired all the time. I'm not sure I felt fit. I've just felt a slightly broken and on the edge of injury most of the time. Having said that, now I've had a sort of lighter week this week and I'm going to have an even lighter week next week. I haven't got any niggles. I feel quite good. And so I can't give you my final, um, <laughs> my final thoughts on the, this uh, painful chapter until like the end of the taper that I'm going to do for nothing uh, next week. But I've enjoyed pushing myself because slightly in the back of my brain, I always knew I wasn't going to get to the race. So I thought I can really push myself in this training block. And I think for the next block, I I will take that volume back down a little bit because I felt I lost a bit of the quality because I was always kind of pushing the volume over the quality. But it's been really interesting to see that I can handle it. But 
the slight joy of running had gone out of it because it became a bit of a chore to hit that volume every week rather than the quality, which is what I always go on about. But I have kept the consistency and I have been very good at the recovery running, mainly because I've been so tired, haven't been able to <laughs> run any faster. But I've enjoyed the experiment and um, and I've sort of, I've improved my self-confidence that I can run that little bit more now. I can put in a bit more, a bit more hours, but I think definitely my next block is going to be less volume and a little bit more quality, mainly for my, um, my, uh, general life as well, because just hobbling around cafe or the supermarket is not much fun all the time. What about you, John? You're ready. You're tapered. You well, feeling... Yeah, it's interesting because I would say I've probably gone slightly a different way this time because I would be more about my my big long run at the weekend and I would build up and I normally have a, a four week pattern of 15 miles, 20 miles and a 30 mile and then and then an easy week and then another block and moving up. Whereas this time, partly because of what you talked about, about the South Downs way being a bit more runnable. So I've actually concentrated on two sessions this this block, the Monday night with the club. So we do our fart leg session. So that's been very much a speed session session and um, that's that's worked well and then the other one I've done which I've not done before is a longer run on a Wednesday because I can I'm working from home at the moment which means that I, I'm up at six I go out for a two-hour run and then I can have a shower and still be at my desk for half eight for work so that's been something I've not done before and I've quite enjoyed that so that Wednesday run and it's it's about a um, thousand feet of climb so it's a decent amount but it's quite, a, it's quite a boggy route at times, especially at the moment. So those have been my two key sessions. And then at the weekend, I've, uh, I've done a 20-mile run and I've done a 30-mile run in that 10-week in that block, which is probably less than I would normally do for a longer run. Um, and then the other thing I've done, tried to do is I took your advice from the, the interview that people will listen about trying to get to the start feeling relaxed and comfortable. And I've only ran twice this week. I ran Sunday and Wednesday just again, just six, seven miles each time. And I do feel as ready as I can be. And so I'm looking forward to tomorrow. And um, thank you for those who, uh, who are listening to this, who are taking part in my Guess My Time competition. I always have a little competition. I started this, my very first ultra in 2007, and it's become a bit of a tradition. And there was 116 guesses for this time, including yours, Eddie. Um, yes. So We've we'll had see. A word. Yeah, you've had a word. So we'll see how that gets on. And the winner gets a lovely uh, belt from Ultra Marathon Running Store that sponsor my uh, my guess my time competitions. So and then there's quite a few people who've got in touch in the Hardmost family who say that they're either starting just ahead of me or just behind me. So the pressure's on for me to <sighs> to to um, to do what I said last week about uh, starting comfortably and finishing well. So I know what's going to happen. If I go off too quick, there's going to be loads of people saying, John, listen to your own advice. You're going far too fast. You're breathing far too heavy. So I've got to really make sure I go off very quickly. You've been hanging tomorrow. out with Eddie way too much, John. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. And then just on this introduction, I just wanted to say thank you so much for those that are listening and taking part. Our Facebook group has over 1.1, I was going to say million there, 1.1 thousand. Just over, I know, just over a thousand people. But one of the lovely things is people are starting to put comments on now. There was a lovely one from Kendra where she talked about um, that, that episode, that top tip that we gave last week about finishing well. And then lots of people made comments on that as well. So feel free if you've got a question that you'd like to, the, the running community to answer as part of this Run to the Hills, then please do that. We, it's lovely to read people supporting each other. And I think that's one of the great things about ultra running, isn't it, Eddie? Uh, you know, we're in this together. Okay, we are racing, it is competitive, but most of the time we're, we're all about supporting each other and helping each other. And we, and I know you as a coach get as much joy out of seeing some of your runners complete races and fulfill their goals as you do uh, in your own running. Oh, absolutely. And I put on, I think I put on Instagram that I'd, I'd had to um, withdraw from the South Downs Way 100. And I got so many lovely messages from people, you know, you don't know them, you know their names, you wouldn't, from uh, social media and lots of lovely messages. And yes, lots of clients going to, into races this week for the um, South Downs Way 100, uh, South Downs Way 50, and then the South Downs Way 100. So um, yeah, it's great when you can't do the race to watch other people and, um, and support other people and see them get to get the get that get to that finish line which seems ne to have never come this year suddenly we've got all these races after a bit of a quiet period yeah. 
Okay, so we're going to move on to race results. Now, the main one that I've been following this week, I'm sure lots of people have been doing so, is the, is the Big Backyard Ultra. And this is a race that Laz, who does the Barclay Marathon, set up a number of years ago. And if you don't know the format, it's, it's an amazing one. You start it, I think it's midday, and every hour you have to run a loop, which is 4.1666 miles. Um, and then every hour you have to start. So if you take 40 minutes to run the, the four and a bit miles, you've got 20 minutes to recover, and then you start again. And it basically keeps on going until there's only one runner left. It's, a, it's an amazing uh, format. And um, so this year there was two runners, Courtney DeWalter and Harvey Lewis, and they were still going after 60, uh, almost 60, 60 hours, and they were the only ones left. And the record, I think, had been um, 70 hours, 69, 70 hours. So they were trying to push each other because if one, fit, one stopped, the other one had to do one more lap, and then they finished. So they were trying to keep going. And, but on the 68th lap, uh, Harvey Lewis dropped out. He was having hallucinations, and Courtney the, the Walter finished. So she she ran 68 laps. So that's 68 hours. So that's over three days, and uh, she ran 283 miles in total. So it's just mind blowing, isn't it? If you haven't seen the video of them setting off on that last lap, I'll, I'll put I'll put it on um, on our Facebook group, and they look. It, they, oh, it looks so <laughs> stiff and they're heading out. I mean, it takes <clears throat> Courtney. I'm a huge Courtney fan, not just her running, but her whole demeanor and her whole way she handles herself. And uh, I love the fact, as I'm sure all the women do, is that she beats the boys and she does it with such poise and good grace and humor. Um, would you like to do that race, John? Um, I don't know really. Yeah, I've not really. Yeah, I've not really considered that one. <laughs> I think I'd have the time to be honest. I was thinking about it, thinking I think I'd be too busy. <laughs> three, <laughs> that three sounds days. a good I excuse. After, I think yes. I think we can use that as an excuse. I've got three children, far too busy <laughs> for that sort of thing. <laughs> I must admit, generally, I think we we mentioned this before. Uh, I'm not a massive fan of of just going round and round loops. Yeah, you know, I, I yeah. think I just love being out. I love the journeys. I saw. I suppose it wouldn't really suit the sort of the, the the enjoyment I would get from from running. And that is, like, say tomorrow, you know, I'm going to run from Giesborough to Hel to Helmsley. I've done the route, you know, loads of times now, but I'm so looking forward to it because I love the different parts of it. You go through the woods, you go up and down Rosemary Topping, you go over the Three Sisters, you've got Whitehorse. I just, I'm looking forward to it, even though I've done it several times because I love the journey and I love the different stages and the different things you go through. Um, so yeah, loops. Yeah. It's not my, it's not, it's not my, uh, it doesn't float my boat as they say. <laughs> okay. There was also a team competition, but I, we weren't quite sure how all that works. So we won't. We both that got one. lost in we our did. old age. We got lost on Facebook <laughs> yeah. trying to find out. I could work out exactly. There was so many, I mean, I love, I sort of saw some of the videos and all the different people. I was like, there was so much social media, um, videos and comments and things. Um, but yeah, we thought we'd just highlight that the, the Courtney's, um, Courtney's result because, um, because we're big fans. Yeah, I did watch a video this week that was done last on last year's one. It's on um, it's on YouTube. I came across it, and uh, in that last talks about one of the things he would love to see is a woman winning one of these races. So that was fun. So um, he got his wish because uh, Courtney <laughs> DeWalter win this year. And his comment was that because the, the format of it, it's uh, he felt it it suits women maybe mm. more than men in mm. some ways because. Mm you are better at pacing yourselves yeah, and looking after endurance. yourself. Yeah, it's endurance. It's endurance over speed, isn't it? Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, and it's it's about the pacing and it's about that sort of the slow burn. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to move on to our competition winner. So last week we set the competition as um, we wanted to hear people's stories of how they'd pace things, how they got things right, um, but also how they got things wrong. So do you want to give a couple of comments and then I'll read the winner out? Yeah, I loved everybody's comments as always about uh, how, they, how they'd had strong finishes. I loved Kim Cavill's um, comment about her Lakeland 50 because I ran that race with her. Mm. And... Um, 
yeah, I loved how she, she, she'd run alongside Amy who was in second place and they'd had a chat and then she'd realized she still had something left in the tank <laughs> and she went for it. And I know because I ran down that Coniston, the back end of that, that quarry that's really steep mm. at the end of the late 50 with her when we rec- wrecked it and she left me for dust. Uh, she's really quick with those fast feet. So um, I can imagine her flying down there. So I loved that comment. But our competition winner, mainly, well, he tugged at the heartstrings, didn't he, John? And we're suckers. We're suckers. for. So yeah, our competition winner was Neil Gibson. And um, I'm, uh, I, must conf- I must say that Neil is a good friend. Um, in fact, we saw them last Everyone's night. Everyone's a good friend of yours, John. <laughs> That's well, I'd like to think that's nice. Um, but it, it, it was a joint decision. I, I, uh, it, was, it wasn't just me, so that was good. So Neil said this, uh, the Highland Fling 2018, I dropped a bottle seven miles in, stopped, picked it up and started running again, but my legs didn't want to. I knew I had a problem that early. Stomach issues followed and I struggled to Balmaha as people came past me in a constant stream. Every checkbook was my last but you kind of need to get past the lock. And besides, John, that's me, would be at the Inversnade for a moral <laughs> boost. Despite everything, I was drop, dropping at Ben Glass. I, I grabbed my drop bag ready to withdraw, but noticed a note from my wife, make your boy proud. And with a slight tear, on I went. I have no idea what my time was, nor how I got to the end that day. But to put it into perspective, I covered that distance and east an hour faster in the full West Harlem Way race a couple of months later. Oh, I've got a tear in my eye just reading that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and if you if you scroll down to the post, you can read. We got him to put a picture of the note that he's yeah. kept. Yeah, up I, on the I, post. I told him he needs to frame it because it's uh, it's such a lovely mm-hmm. note that yeah. But it just shows, doesn't it? Just sometimes, just something like that can get you through, can't it? You know, just one comment or that one note from his wife, and it just changed the perspective of how he thought about things. It didn't change it physically but it changed how he felt about it. And somehow he found the, the resolve to get to the end. Um, it's so, all about that mental fortitude. Yeah. It's that mental fortitude and finding your why, why you want to finish. Yeah. Uh, and it's not physical, as we know, as you'll know, post <laughs> <laughs> a few hours into tomorrow. Yeah. Okay, so well done to Neil. And there'll be some, the starter pack on uh, winging its way to you as soon as possible. Um, so we're going to move on now to our, our main interview. And as Eddie has already mentioned, we wanted to do something that would help people prepare for next year. And people are starting to think about next year and starting to plan ahead. And it is one of the things which I think you do have to do more. When I, um, when I first started ultra running, not that long ago, you could get a place in a race pretty well a few weeks before. Whereas now people do have to plan a bit more. There's ballots, there's um, different entries. And so people, I think, do start to plan a little bit more ahead. So whether you have a coach or not, we really hope that this interview will help you. Um, it's with, uh, I was interviewing Eddie and, and Dave Troman, and um, we covered a lot of different subjects. So we really hope this will help you. Any other little sort of hints, Eddie? Uh, I know you've written a blog post, so maybe you can just explain how that goes with this interview. Yeah, I wrote, I actually listened to the interview again to write the blog post and we do talk, yeah, and you know me, there's a lot of talking. Uh, we do talk a lot. There's a lot of information. And if you, as most people do listen to the podcast when they're on the move or doing something else, you can sort of think that was so much information. Where do I go with all that? Because we were trying to impart uh, all our knowledge in about 50 minutes. So what I did for the blog, which is on the cheer charge website is um sort of pull out the key bits so if you you don't need to make your own notes as you're running along for all our nuggets wisdom so if you listen to it and you think oh what did they say about so and so if you pop over to the blog um i sort of highlighted the the sort of key points and that will prompt you to um to if you're thinking about planning your sort of next year already which you should be because yes as you said the ballots race entries and and especially now with lots of race entries carried over to next year there's fewer places Races in lots of races and your year might look a bit funny next year as well because you might have a race at a funny time of year that's been moved to a different um, to a different month than it normally is so hopefully there's something in there for for the seasoned ultra runner the old wizened ultra runners like us and the newbies that are looking at how on earth do I you know approach my first ultra and Dave was brilliant um, he had some absolute um, pearls of wisdom in there and some good phrases and um, a really obviously has a really good approach to his clients. And we really enjoyed talking to him and we're hopefully going to have him back on the show not too long. 
um, with some more um, with some more really um, really good information about training. I would say for someone like myself, who's, um, you know, I've been doing ultras for quite a while now, but I really enjoyed it. And there was a few things that I really took away from the interview that I'm going to try and put into practice. So listen now particularly to Eddie and Dave's thoughts on the long run. And I thought that was particularly interesting, just their take on that and how that works. So I hope you enjoy this uh, next 50 minutes. And if you're out running somewhere as you do so, then enjoy your run. And uh, hopefully you'll learn as much as, as much as I did from this interview. All right, for this episode of Run to the Hills, we thought we wanted to do some, something on coaching. It's now uh, the end of October and people are starting to think about next year and their big, big races and what they've got planned. So we thought we'd have a chat with a couple of coaches and we've got our co-host, Eddie, and we've also invited along Dave Troman. So thanks, Dave, for joining us. And maybe just to start with, you could just give us a little bit of your background and maybe how you got into coaching. Yeah, sure. So... I mean, I've been racing competitively for the best part of 40 years now. So, um, and then a number of years ago, an ex-pupil of mine um, contacted me and asked me if I would help coach her for a big adventure that she was doing out in uh, New Zealand. So we got doing that and I really enjoyed doing that whole process. So um, I then looked to get in a whole load of different qualifications to get behind me. Um, I asked a few friends of mine if they wanted some free coaching so I could kind of learn my style and work out my logistics. And then I kind of sat down in front of the computer and Googled, how do you set up your own business? Um, I thought you were going to say, Googled, how do I coach? <laughs> no, I didn't. Shh. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and literally it was, you know, one stage at a time, went down the bullet points of how do you set up a business and kind of went on from there. And it's it's to say it snowballed would be a bit of an understatement so now I'm a very part-time teacher and if people ask me what I do as a job now I actually say I'm a running coach and I do some part-time teaching whereas up until a year or so ago I would have probably said it the other way around um so, yeah, so that's that's where I am now yep yeah. and your company what's it called it's called love to run coaching which came to my head once I was out running kind of it's the hardest part of setting up a business is what to call it and it just came to me when I was running around Glendora Terra one evening, you know the route, John. Back in, typed it in, nobody else was using that name, so I, I grabbed it. Excellent, and um, we will put links on the show notes so people want to uh, find out more about your, your business, then they can do so. Now, I do realize, both Dave and Eddie, that if I was one of your clients, you'd be charging me for this, so I do feel quite privileged that we're getting this, uh, <laughs> unless, bucks, you are, unless, unless you oh, are going to give us an invoice afterwards. <laughs> I was um, going to go with mates rates, but whatever, go on. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think for those that are listening, it's a great privilege to have both of you, uh, the experience that you've both, both got in running and in coaching, and we wanted this episode just to, be, to help people to think about planning for next year. So we've got a number of questions and I'm going to ask each of you different questions. And I'm hoping that you will chip in with the other answers as well. And we'll get a little bit of a sense of that bigger picture. And that's what we're thinking about this evening, trying to think about the, the broader aspect of coaching. So Dave, can we start with, if you have a client coming to you, uh, where would you start with a plan? So you obviously you're going to look for what ask them what the, the A race for the year is, and that's the one that you're going to build the plan around. Um, but I'm I'm very keen on working on training cycles. So once you've got what is the main race in, and then thinking about right how many training cycles, and the cycle will depend on a number of factors: the experience of the athlete, what conditioning they've got, what. A particular training cycle has as a focus you know perhaps a, um, a higher volume lower intensity block cycle could be a little bit longer a higher intensity um, might be a shorter block and I would work the cycles back to where we are now then we'd be thinking about putting in I usually call them stepping stones so that might be a race or it might be um, I do the one I, I sometimes call it an adventure. So it might be going out on the route and doing a big recce of the route. It doesn't necessarily have to be a race. Um, and once you've got those kind of significant points in throughout the year, then you can start to build, you know, what training do I need to be doing when during the year going forward? 
Right. Uh, thanks, Dave. And that gives a bit of a plan, a bit of an idea of where the plan goes. Um, so, Eddie, if you were doing a plan, uh, what factors do you take into consideration? Well, just I, I pretty much work almost the same as Dave does on that initiation program of making the plan. Um, what I always do is uh, I have a really good chat with a new client about, um, or if I'm making my own plan, so what have I got to take into consideration which isn't running in this plan? Because the running has to fit in with the plan rather than the other way around because it won't work then and the athlete will either get ill, injured or divorced. And so... <laughs> I always find out, I'll try and really get into the nitty gritty of someone else's life, their job, their family, um, previous sport. People always find it funny, especially the older generation, when I ask them what sport they did at school, because it plays a huge role into, even if you haven't done sport for a long time, how active you were as a child, as to then how you sort of shape the plan. Because if somebody's been used to doing sport when they're younger, they tend to get back into sport a little bit easier. Anyway, I've digressed. So uh, when I, the factors I sort of take in are family, job, and the biggest one then, and this sort of feeds into it, is the recovery time an athlete has, because you're only ever as good on a plan as the recovery you can give yourself we could all go out and run 100 mile weeks if we really wanted to but if we haven't got the recovery time to then get fitter which is what the plan is all about to get fitter and stronger then it's useless really the plan is just going to break us so I sort of take that all into consideration and then build a plan and I always tell an athlete as well when we're building the plan is this plan is the gold star of what you can do but if you only do 80% of this plan, you're still doing really well. It's got to be flexible and it's got to fit in with you. So those are the sort of main factors that I put into consideration and that I tell other people to put into consideration too, that building the plan has to be so much more than just these running sessions. It has to be about how are these running sessions going to fit into into life and to make it sustainable because it's all about i know dave will agree it's all about consistency that's what we're looking for in any plan yeah i was just going to add and eddie you'll probably back me up on this you get i find you get two different types of athlete that come to you there's one that comes along and says right this is my main goal for the year can you or can we together build a plan that's going to get me to that point there and then we can build that plan and then we might find the stepping stones that fit the plan. Other times you get an athlete that comes along and says, right, this is my main race and I want to do this one, this one, this one, and this one as well. And then you've got to build a plan that fits those races. So there's two different ways of looking at it. Are you the type of athlete that wants to have um, build a plan that will fit the events you're going to do? Or are you the kind of athlete who will find the events that will fit into the best plan that you can kind of put together to make the most of your time and your lifestyle and all the rest of it? And I think one of the things you've got to do if you're building your own plan is to think about that. Am I going to build the plan to fit the races or am I going to get the races or the events to fit? the plan that I want. And yeah, that's, that's really interesting because it's a different way of looking at it, isn't it? And I, th I suppose as well, the, the, uh, the advantage of having you guys as a coach or having a coach is that it's, it is going to be tailored to you, isn't it? You know, there's loads of plans on the internet. You can, re you can get books, you can just uh, get a, a plan and then just try and, and follow it. But that doesn't take into consideration the things that you've both mentioned about family and work. And, uh, you know, if, if people work shifts and they work evening, uh, work through the night, there's going to be certain days. All these things you take into consideration, don't you? I always say the easiest part is writing the plan for a client. It's a joy. You know, you get, especially if the, the, this is what I want to do, da, da, da. writing the plan, you know, it, that's relatively easy. It's then managing the plan and managing the athlete is the bit that takes takes the time and and is and Dave I'm sure you agree is quite a learnt process of coaching because everybody's different and everybody reacts differently to training and to and to how they manage their plan as well for some people if the plan doesn't work and they need to change it it's disaster yeah. and it's the yeah. end of the world and some people are much more flexible and it's all about that sort of relationship so yeah a lot of people when they put their own plan together following what Eddie just said there is that you don't want to be 
too rigid you want to be ready to quickly adapt the plan i think one of the things about having a coach and a lot of people have said this is that maybe the coach looks at the overview with a slightly colder attitude i think the athlete Mm. often has too much of an emotional attachment to their own running and they keep pushing on and pushing on until it all breaks and goes horribly wrong whereas i any coach will look at it a little bit with a bit of detachment and probably and I don't know what Edwina would say to this, but I, I seem to spend a lot of time holding people back a little bit because they've mentioned tiredness three times in three yeah. consecutive days. Yeah. And you go, hang on a minute, right, let's change the rest of this week. I can see where this is going. Whereas normally they would probably just plow on and plow on until something goes. I always talk about the helicopter view that I'm the helicopter and I can oversee where they're going and I can see and exactly and 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 I ask for a lot of dialogue in my training plans because I say it's like a diary and we can look back and and exactly say look you've said that tired word four Mm -hmm. times in a row and then they will look back and or just the piece in the jigsaw and you're like this is just a very small piece this rest day it's not going to ruin UTMB 2022 I promise you if you have a couple of rest days now let's think a little bit more about then these sort of blocks because you've both talked about having the bigger picture and then breaking it down into, into blocks. So Dave, uh, do you look at the whole year? Obviously you, do, you said you do in your plan, um, but is it individual races or particular blocks which you think are more important than others? I tend, what, what I think the mistake a lot of runners, mis- a lot of runners make is that they, they tend to try and do a bit of everything all the time. Whereas, in fact, if they actually focused on certain elements of performance at certain times in the year, which then takes them on a kind of natural progression towards their target. And this, when I talk about training cycles, this is what I mean. And the, the kind of fancy word, that periodization. So it's all about deciding for each individual athlete what series of training focuses is going to progress that athlete at their optimum level to reach their best performance they can on race day. Um, And then to add into that mix, um, you need to think about the race specificity of the different focuses of training. So perhaps you're doing the training which is most race specific nearer to the race and the training which is less race specific but still needs to be done further away. So if you're training for a 100 miler, you do still need to do some lactate threshold training. You still need to do some sort of high intensity VO2 max type training because these are like your ceilings. So you've got to do something with those, but you don't want to be doing those in the immediate build up to the race because that's maybe when you want to be doing your, your sort of leg conditioning, your higher volume work, because that's what you're going to need in the race. Um, Whereas if you're training for a fast 50 K then that might change because, well, actually you do need to be pushing that. That lactate threshold training is really important at that time. So maybe that's going to be done a little bit closer to the race. So you start playing around with different elements. Think about if you're doing a particularly hilly race, uh, hilly race, a mountainous race, where do you want to put your climbing conditioning? Where do you want to put your really important downhill conditioning for those quads? Where do you want to put that in relation to where the race is? So you, rather than trying to do a bit of everything all the time have certain focuses at certain times of the year and then this will allow you to kind of progress throughout the year rather than progress very quickly and then just stagnate because again what will you do when you start to stagnate what does every runner do well i've either got to do more of what i'm doing or i've got to do it harder (laughs) and we, we both know we all know where that's going to lead so that's my mantra dave yeah Sorry, which one? What was which one was that? Hashtag more, more, more. <laughs> yeah. It's true though, isn't it? It's it, yeah. Most runners will simply go right. I've got to get fitter, so I'm going to do more of this, or I'm going to do it harder. Mm. And that's not how it works. And would you say, Dave, um, that the clients you have is that quite new to them? Because I must admit, you know, j- just listening to that, I, 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 I confess that I probably don't do that. I, I probably do try and do a bit of everything all the time. Um, and that sounds quite uh, different to me. So is that something which you find clients that's a, yeah, a new thing definitely. to them? The, the line I, when I when I talk, sit down for the first time with a new client. And one of the things I talk about is having focused training blocks. And the phrase I use is most runners tickle lots of elements of performance at the same time, but they don't really, you've got to stress your body in order to, to make it better, to make it fitter. Um, 
but they don't really stress one element. They do a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and a little bit of that, and everything improves, but only to a certain point. And then you're actually limited by your time availability, your ability to recover, your age, your previous experiences. That will limit you eventually. So if you can sequence things and address each element properly, you're going to get an overall better performance at the end of it. And it's about, you know, I think one of the points of doing a year plan is to then find what is the best sequence for me to take me to my best performance. I think it's, it's very hard because it sounds, the way you explained it, it sounds like, well, I, I have to work on all these different things. I don't have time to work on my speed and my hill strength, but it doesn't need to be a magic huge block. It can be a couple of weeks of, yeah. okay, I'm really, I'm going to take the volume right down and I'm going to have a little cracker. I'm going to have a 5k time trial and then I'm going to do a three week focus on speed. And then I'm going to go back and do a 5k time trial. And then I'm going to go into some bigger volume running and keep that speed going through the plan. It doesn't need to be, you know, four months focused on downhill running it can just be like a couple of sessions and if you if you think oh I'm, I'm not sure what I should be focusing on then you just look at your race and have a look at the race profile see what you know is there a lot of climbing is there a lot of downhill is there a long flat 12 mile section in the middle of a race where I'm going to need to keep some speed going and just make it simple and if you're not sure and you haven't got a race like at the moment um, coming up just think of the thing you don't really like doing in running and that <laughs> tends to be the thing that you're going to need to work a little bit on yeah yeah okay this is all great advice thank you so much i think one of the things which most runners come come across at some point is injury or sickness you know you've got a, a training plan that you're working towards whether you've done it yourself or you've got a coach helping you and um, and then you get injured or you get sick and it's quite close to the race so eddie what sort of advice would you give to someone or one of your clients or someone who's listening to this who is in that situation or might face that situation put it all over facebook and ask yeah. loads of people who don't know anything <laughs> yeah. their uh what they would do that is that's a joke. Well, let's take the example that you're getting quite close to your race. Um, and so you're, you're quite maybe at the peak of your training, you've got maybe like four to five weeks till your race. And perhaps you get a little niggle, let's say. So the first thing that you need to do is to rest. I'm not a big advocate, actually, from, I don't know what Dave will say about this, but I like to keep clients moving as much as possible. Um, I, I think actually sitting down, and it depends on the injury, obviously, but seek some professional advice, a physio, not Facebook or Instagram, um, and, and, and rest, and then we can look at other ways of training. I see, but I see so many people um, on social media who get a niggle and then they cross train like crazy to try and maintain that fitness but your body if you do have a little injury um it needs to be told i'm resting and then have the energy to heal that injury it's almost like a signal from your brain okay well i'm resting so the energy i normally use for training i'm going to use to start healing that injury if you cross train like crazy you are not giving your body the energy and the headspace to start recovering and um i can't remember her name but the lady who was a British champion at the London Marathon 10 days ago, I was listening to her on a podcast and she hadn't run more. She ran five miles the three weeks before she was British champion at the London Marathon. So that goes to show that actually, if you do get a little niggle, those four, a few weeks before a race, you... you don't need to panic train. Actually, sometimes rest um, or light cross training is the best thing to do rather than cross train the hell out of it, possibly get another injury from cross training and then go into the race, Not, neither healed and neither really fit. So the, that, was, that would be my first thing would be to rest, to seek a professional opinion, not to panic and talk to your coach. Don't hide it from your coach and then say a week later, oh yeah, my hamstring's been hurting for a while. Dave, I expect you see this sort of thing quite a lot as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what, what I tend to, I, I tend to put my sport, sports psychology hat on and I go down the route of like, okay, this is something we can't control. So we're going to rest. If you work out the, I, I talk them through the percentage of performance that they might lose. So work out how many hours of training you've done over the previous six months or whatever, and then work out what percentage am I losing out on here? And it's a tiny, tiny percentage. Yeah. 
So first of all, you can you you get the athlete to think a bit more positively. That, that's a starting point. Then I'm very strong on going out like, what else can we control? And one of the things that's great about ultra running, ultra races, is there are so many facets and elements that you that you need to put together to make a good race. Okay, we might have lost a couple of percentage training wise, but can we? control our hydration our nutrition our uh, sorry during the race i'm talking about um can we make sure that we're properly hydrated before the event starts instead of drinking 14 gallons the day before and then spending and then just peeing it all out let's do all this properly so at least when you stand on the start line you then go in well you know what actually i've controlled most things a tiny tiny bit's gone but how many other things can go wrong in the race anyway yeah, so and there's so much, there's so there's so much endurance you need for these ultra races that there's actually there's so many other facets as you said that you can that you can work on your strength and conditioning, your hiking if that's not going to aggravate the injury further, your nutrition, your think your mental preparation, and actually having a bit of headspace to think about the race to study the profile. There's so many other things that you can do without, like you said, just focusing on that injury and it becoming bigger than Donald Trump. Excellent. And again, some great advice there. And I think it's something which uh, most people listening to this will have faced or will face that, that niggle, particularly when it gets closer to a race, you know, so I think some great advice there. Dave, the next question I wanted to um, just to explore was, I think a lot of people that move into ultras uh, are a bit daunted by the distance. You know, if you've done a marathon and you're moving up to 50k or even longer to 100k or 100 miles, and it's that long run and building up the, the time on your feet. Uh, so what advice do you give to, to your clients or you give to people listening on, on, on how to build up the mileage to a, a longer, longer run? First thing I would say is don't become obsessed with the longer, longer run. <laughs> if Again, it's this thing about, uh, and Eddie mentioned it earlier about consistency of training. It's far more important to make sure that you're completing your training blocks than it is to, right, I must get out and do a six hour run and go out and do a six hour run, which then takes you, even if it then takes you two weeks to recover from that, or heaven forbid you, you're actually now injured and you miss even longer, that's, that's a negative thing. That's not gonna work as well. So I, I'm far more interested in perhaps, okay, we wanna increase the training load over a period of time. Now that training load doesn't have to be rammed into one day. That extra training load can be spread out during the week or during a two week cycle or whatever it is that you're doing or, or potentially a three week cycle even. So we are increasing time on your feet, as you said, um, but we're not necessarily doing it all in one go. Back to that thing about, well, OK, I can do a three hour run, but doing that extra three hours to make it a six hour run. Again, that's a tiny percentage of your overall training. So don't be fretting over it. Having said all that, there is a certain psychological crutch that you can get from going out and doing the long run and practicing your nutrition and making sure your kit works and so on. But it needs to be built up over the six months that you're going to be building up for this race. So you might be, you know, adding on, okay, so I, I can do a three hour run, right? Let's just see if I can, you know, two weeks time, I'm going to try and do a three and a half hour run or sort of maybe three and a quarter hour run. But then we're going to be adding in, that's got to coincide after it with a little bit of a recovery period. So you're then thinking, right, I've got say a three week training cycle. At the end of that three week training cycle, I might be having a go at a slightly longer run, but I know that's going to be followed by four, five, four days, five days, six days, seven days, eight, whatever of slightly cut back training so that I'm giving my body time to recover, repair, get fitter during that recovery cycle. But again, I find this where ultra runners are obsessed with going out. I have to go out and do a six or seven hour run. Well, no, you don't. The Camille Heron, the American who broke the 100 mile world record last year, I think it was last year, like an insanely fast time, just basically did marathon training. So, did, you know, and didn't do any monster long runs at all. You don't have to go out and do it. It's about the consistency of the training. Yeah, I totally agree with Dave that the, people get a bit um, uh, 
transfixed on that if they haven't done six hour regular six hour runs in their training block they're not an ultra runner but as I said earlier it's all about consistency and actually a three hour run is a long way and it takes quite a lot out of your body um when people are sort of building up long runs into their programs as well and I understand as I've been coaching more and more people love the long run lots of people it's there you know if you're stuck in an office you want to be going out for hours in the mountains and it's taken me a while to sort of like you have to get the balance between allowing people that you know I love I want to go out I've got five hours and I'm like yeah but then the next week you've got to not hit this is that's the job of us coaches is to get that balance and to and to educate people on the balance that okay well if you do that five hour run that's not really a gain in your fitness because we're then going to need you're then going to need to back off on this session and you're you know you're not going to be able to go to the track session on Tuesday so it's about educating people but another way that I look at as well is I do quite a lot of a bit more intensity in the long run so then we sort of have a melange a little bit of French there for you guys um, <laughs> Uh, we have a little mixture of like um and it also breaks up the training if you've got quite a long training box so we'll have a and i i'll let somebody who loves a four hour run we're gonna do like you know go wild go for that four hour run but then the next week we'll do a much shorter run lot long run so i class anything over 90 minutes as a as a longer run because of the stress on the body so i said well we're gonna do two hours the next week and we're gonna run it as like half an hour really easy, half an hour steady, into 10 minutes at marathon pace, the rest of the run steady. So you're still getting a long run benefit, but you're doing it a little bit faster, getting those ultra legs moving a bit faster. And then the week after we might do like three hours, nice and easy. So the long run doesn't have to be six hour stable. You can make it into all sorts of different things in your plan so that you don't get stale and that you're not always Sunday going for this long run and then spending Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. I call them in triathlon, their big thing, weekend warriors that put everything into the weekend and then spend till Thursday recovering and then they're ready to go again the weekend. So just think of different ways that you can do your long run that aren't then going to impact on the rest of the week. But then, as I said, if you still love those super long runs, you can get those into the plan as well it's all about that careful planning yeah that's great and i'm sure people listening to this watching this that's going to be a really helpful thing because i would say most people like myself who are self-coached that the long run is the sort of uh, you know is the key thing that I, I build into my blocks and just as you say you, you need those but you do need to also to, to listen to the advice there that you've given so thank you very thank, thank you very much now the next question i want to give both of you because this is going to be again a real benefit to those of us who are sort of listening carefully and that is have you got a go-to session that you like to uh, incorporate with your clients have you got that session which you know is going to give a good benefit uh, so eddie have you got a favorite session or a go-to session it's going to cost you this one, John. It's going to cost you. <laughs> well, one session that I find that is a good telltale sign of fitness and anybody can do. And the good thing about it is you can do it at any intensity is a three minute effort. There's no because there's no hiding in a three minute effort you've got to pace it right you can't go off too fast otherwise you're just going to get too slow um it's long enough that um it's going to hurt but it's not too long that you've got to hold into that so you should be able to maintain your form and i like to repeat this quite in nearly all my training cycles you can do it as a hill so you can do it all sorts of different ways but i find six to eight to ten not not normally set ten six to eight times three minutes with normally two to three minutes again depending on the client depending on the fitness depending on the session uh recovery is a really good indicator of how how fitness you're going and you can do it relatively unfit because you can just go right my three minute is going to just be a steady effort not a sort of balls out session and then i'm just going to jog recover and you can see how recovery goes so you can mix it up but those three minutes you can work relatively hard in those three minutes without um killing yourself if you give somebody a one minute session they will go flat out and then probably ping the hammy so three minutes is great and often clients will see it about four weeks into training plan, five times three minutes. Let's see, let's see how you are at pacing. Let's see if you can go, you, how you, cause it tells you so much about the athlete and the women tend to be better than the men at this. Can you make those three minutes a consistent pace? How are you recovering? How did you feel on the last bank of those three minutes? And I know personally, if I can do, I do this on the treadmill quite a bit in the winter when I can't run fast outside. And I know if eight by three minutes, if I can hold those all at the same pace and be 
recovering in between, I'm good to go. I'm fit. Um, so yeah, that's one of my three minutes is one of my staple favorites. Well, Dave. thank you very, thank you very much for sharing that one. And I'm sure that will re again, really help. I look people. forward to it on everyone's Stravas now. That's, yeah. that's right. Six by three minutes. <laughs> yeah. And Dave, would you have a, 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 a that's session? interesting because mine's very, very similar, but I would just do it slightly longer rep so what, what what i would call like a steady state run so the kind of pace that you could maintain for say about 45 minutes at the most so a lot of people that might be around about your 10k road race pace but doing that in shorter intervals than that so it might, it might be six minute intervals you might do three times six minutes with five minute recovery in between going up higher more conditioned athletes some of the, the better athletes might even be doing kind of three times 15 minutes with five recovery in between but it's not balls out to quote edwina um, sorry it's sorry, I said that. <laughs> it's um it's probably running at 75 80 percent not flat out and again you said it i mean uh, the the men it's testosterone comes out i've got to do these at 90 percent and they don't even finish the session um and what 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 i use those sessions for it can come somewhere in the periodization where you are perhaps you're wanting to raise one of your ceilings a little bit to so you can then improve your run all day pace you've got to lift these other ceilings as well so i could you could use it for that but also coming back to the previous question actually i was i was i was going to dive in on the previous one but i thought no i'll save it for this one um when you've your push for time when you're thinking about these long runs and or you or you're obsessed with doing the long run so one of the things i often do with athlete is use one of these steady state rep sessions to get them tired on one day. So the legs are a little bit beaten up. And then the next day we can go out and maybe we only need a couple of hours of a long run, but we're getting a grip by the end of it. You're actually starting to feel that kind of that fatigue that you would get at the end of a, say a three or four hour run, but you'll recover way, way quicker than going out and doing a single three or four hour run. So you can kind of get, the benefits and then recover that little bit quicker by playing around and get you know most people wouldn't well a lot of runners would go well I'm, i've got a long run tomorrow so i'm not going to do a, a faster session today but for an ultra runner you could actually use that just to beat yourself up a little bit to then but then i'm, I'm not saying do one of those speed sessions and then go out and do like for a seven hour minutes. run the next day i'm not saying that i'm saying you can do a shorter longer run but get a greater longer run benefit from it by using those kind of sessions so you can play around with them at different points within the periodization cycles i do that one a lot with um sort of about uh five weeks six weeks out we do a progressive run on the saturday so just enough to take that edge off the legs um, yeah. especially for people that have got families and they're yeah. at home you know the only time they're going to see their kids or their wife or their partner is at the weekend and you know saying weekend after weekend i'm going out for four hours mm. or yeah. having to get up really early it's all stress on the body that you don't need so i'm always looking at ways to sort of help with that help with mm. that stress and help with those relationships so often on a saturday just like you said that i'll give a little bit of a session not huge depending on the athlete um to sort of like so you're going into sunday a little bit fatigued and then yeah because it's the third hour on those long runs that's the destruction really yeah. um it the first two hours you can you know don't you john like the first two hours once you're conditioned and you're fit it's the third hour however fit we are that's where you start feeling so to get that feeling a little bit earlier um, and to carry on running with good form, thinking about other things so that, again, educating the athlete, you're running, you know, that second day feeling tired. How are you running? Are you still thinking about your running posture? Are you still running strong? Are you still eating and drinking? Or are you just <laughs> running along like that? So sorry, I jumped in. No, that's great. <laughs> but I've got one more question for each of you and then a question for both of you. Okay, so Eddie, if you could just tell us a little bit about taper in a plan. I think tapering is one of those things that you've got a race coming up and you start tapering three weeks before, two weeks before, one week before. Uh, so any, any thoughts and help on um, when to taper? Well, again, it's very athlete dependent um, and depends on the training cycle they've just been through. It depends how important the race is, where it fits into the plan. There's so many variables, but let's just say, um, and also how long the race is going to be, because I 50 mile taper is quite different to 
a hundred mile taper, but there's sort of some fundamentals. And so I get the athlete to envision themselves at the start line. How do you want to feel? And then let's work back from there to make, to get you there feeling, you want to be feeling at the start line, super fresh. And as an ultra, especially a really long, arduous ultra, you want to be, or a multi-day, you want to be slightly undercooked. And this is where the, the tricky balance is. You want to be at your fitness peak, but you're possibly just going down because it's better to be just going down than to be going up and to be tired. So envisaging your athlete at the, at the, at the start line, I was going to say finish line, start line, fresh, feeling ready to go um and hungry to race because i think a lot of people get the taper wrong in that they they taper too late you know we all done the panic training the six by three minutes two days before that's gonna make all the difference so yeah i get the athlete to think about how they want to feel at the start line um and then yeah it's really dependent on the athlete their experience their other factors i keep going on about so boring in their life because if you've got a very busy job you're getting up multiple times for kids in the night you have to get up early if once you've got to carry on with the rest of your life so you take the running out a little bit earlier perhaps they're going to get that little bit more rest they're going to get that to think about the good nutrition that little bit that little bit of extra sleep is so important um so i kind of like to start thinking of a taper even whatever the distance about three weeks before the race and possibly in that first third week that first week of the three weeks the athlete wouldn't notice that they were tapering but in my head in the plan there's just perhaps a little bit drop off of volume depending on the race perhaps there's a little bit of little bit of touching on some top end speed with a bit of strides going in there that they're just sort of like as the volume's going down we're just going remind your legs that they can move a little bit of faster the sort of finishing touches of the plan are happening in that and then perhaps the last long run the last kit check and then the two weeks is all about the icing and the cherry and the way that looks is very different depending on the on the race but i think i think especially a really long race um you want to get to that start line slightly um have i done enough you know am i you know i don't feel i've run for a long time that kind of feeling rather than oh my god i you know i'm i'm tired so i'm all about getting there being conservative in those last three weeks rather than um than over overdoing it and you sit all the time of people you think why are you doing that but some people having said all that some people um mentally and physically can do quite well um training quite close up to them and camille heron who we mentioned earlier i know she she goes out and and will run 10 miles a day before a 100 mile world record attempt so it's very individual and it's often tried and tested as well and the more that you race and the more you put taper into your plan the more you know what works with you and that's why i like to talk to athletes about a taper as well so they have they feel that they've had an input into it um and they understand it and that they can do what works for them as well yeah i must admit Eddie, i love that idea of uh, of getting your athlete to think about uh, on the start line how they're going to feel I, I, I like that way around you know because um uh, so many of us do get to the start line uh, overcooked you know and i think it's 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 a it's a it's a skill in itself isn't it to get to the start line feeling ready to go dave yeah, I was just going to add it. Totally agree in everything that Eddie said there, and I, I like to use the word cruising. So when we when we're going through a taper, I want my athlete to feel like they're cruising along. Now that usually, basically, what I want them to do is, and Eddie said this is, don't forget that you can still run fast because you've usually come off the back of sort of big bigger volume training because you've been building up to it, and it's very easy to get into that kind of grind running. Um, mm. And I just like to remind them you can run fast, and that's the last kind of mm. thoughts they have before they go into a race. And then when they get in there, they go into the actual race. They're then going, actually, you know what? This is actually quite easy. I, I was actually skipping along last week, and this is so much slower. And that's just so good for confidence and all the rest of it. Um, so I, I, for my sessions um, as part of the taper, I tend to. I have them labelled as, as taper cruising reps. So they might go out and do it, going back to this, it might be some kind of three or four minute reps, but this is now only at kind of like seven out of 10 effort, but that's still more than the five or six out of 10 effort that you're going to be doing in the race. So we just get that lovely bouncy cruising on. This is so easy. That's how you want your athlete to go into a race, isn't it? Feeling positive. Yeah. 
cruisy Excellent. and confident. Cruisy Absolutely. and confident. Yeah. Oh, we, some... we could put oh. that on your t-shirt, Dave. That's right. Hashtag, hashtag. <laughs> That's great. Lots of lots of key key words there, which we'll take we'll take on board. And Dave, question for you was: uh, you talked a few times, and both of you talked about recovery. And it seems to me, when I talk to people who have coaches, that's one of the the real benefits of, uh, of having a coach of helping them to to recover better. So just just share some thoughts about uh, putting recovery in your pl- in your plans. Yeah, what what you have to remember is you actually you only get fitter when you're recovering. When you're training, you're actually just breaking yourself. That's the whole point of training. You're trying to stress your body systems. You're doing micro damage to your muscle fibers, all that, all your soft tissues, your cardiovascular. You're actually breaking yourself a little bit, and that's what you should be doing. Um, and then when you're recovering, when you're asleep at night, and then when you have these kind of sh- these periods where you're maybe the training's cut back a little bit, you're still training, but it's it's a bit more kind of active recovery stuff. That's actually when you get fitter. Um, so you've got to build these into the plan. A, a lot of runners will just kind of training, 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 going off into the distance, and then at some point they'll get injured or they'll get fatigued, and they'll now become really annoyed and peed off because they can't train. So you then start going, well, actually, I think I'm nearly ready to train again. So I'll start training again now, but now I'm going to make up for the time that I've just lost. And there's probably people sitting, listening to this now going, nodding their head going, Oh yeah, that was me. If you actually build the training into your plan, you don't then have this kind of reluctance to do it. Whereas when it's forced upon you, that's when we hate it and we make wrong decisions. The second thing, psychology hat on, um, I'm a strong believer that your brain will allow you to train better if you know that there's recovery built into the plan. Your brain is very, very good at kind of self-preservation. And if you've got this wonderful plan written down and there's six months of wonderful training going off into the distance. And you look at this somewhere, somewhere in the back here, it's been going in, where am I going to recover? And therefore it, I think it will just hold you back a little bit just as a self-preservation. Whereas if you know, right, I've got this training cycle coming up now, I've got three weeks with this focus on this. I can really go for it in this three weeks. And then I've got this, this cut back week where I can be, it'll be a little bit easier. Um, you'll actually get more out of yourself. You'll be more motivated and you'll get greater quality out of what you're trying to do in the training cycle if you know you've got recovery built in. And is that something you would tell your, your clients, Dave? Because um, that's one, one of my sit down things, first yeah. meeting with a client, one of my principles, that's one of my principles. Yeah, because I have heard people talking about to have a, a, you know, a coach and they've got no idea what they're doing week by week. They, they just given the session on the sessions on the Sunday and then they're going to do that for the week. But I've got the impression some of them don't quite know how, what, what they'll be doing in four weeks time. But you're saying that you, you really need to know that there is some recovery built in. Yes, absolutely. And what, what I would do is I, I only tend to send at the longest, I'll only send about two weeks worth of training at a time because that two weeks is probably going to change anyway. There's no point. It's, it's, there's no point in sending six months of training to a, to a client because I don't know what's going to happen in a week's time. Um, but what I will fill in is going ahead on the plan. I will start filling in where it says recovery block um mate that they're not setting concrete and you can do things like you know if you end up getting a bit of a cold then i'll say okay why don't we make this while well, you've got a cold let's make this a bit of recovery week i know you're going to feel lousy but your legs are actually going to recover quite well if we cut things back and then we'll juggle the the, the various sort of blocks around again um but if they if if the athlete knows or if you're planning your own training then start putting them in um and going forward to my the very last question um plan around your life so right we know when we're going away from for a family holiday or something and you know that maybe you're gonna have to you're you're devoting more time to family over that well okay make that back a cutback week make that a recovery week um if you know that you're gonna have a particularly tough time at work you know that, that maybe there's a deadline due and you know that's going to be a tough week that's adding more stress on to you so let's reduce some of the physiological stress from training during that week or make that a cut that week. So you kind of play around with your life, 
play around with your training, but make sure you know when those periods are going to come because you will train better knowing that it's going to be there. And then um, just the, the final question, I just want to say thank you so much to both of you for sharing your hard-earned knowledge and, uh, and, uh, and I can see why your clients enjoy having you as coaches. Um, but just for those who may be writing their own plan, you know, there are a good number of people who don't have a coach and write their own plans down. So what one tip would you give to someone who was sitting down, they've got a big race coming up next year, maybe the Lakeland 100 or UTMB or whatever it is, and they're starting to think about next year now. Uh, what one tip would you give them in writing their own plan? And Eddie, maybe you could start for us put myself out of a job here but I do, would like to say don't be scared to write your own plan because you um I work with, with you know the hundred different hundreds of different people over the past sort of 10 years and um and you know yourself really well and um you know how you feel and actually part of a successful ultra is knowing yourself knowing your pace knowing how you're feeling knowing how you're feeling there's a lot you can teach yourself um there's also a lot of knowledge obviously dave and i can uh, <laughs> share with you that you you uh, that you don't have but um d don't be scared to write your to give it a go to write to write your own plan i'd say two of the most important things well consistency of the plan is absolutely that is absolutely my buzzword of anything consistency in the plan so be realistic with what you set yourself to go underplay yourself so that you will achieve i'm a big one of that don't you know set set yourself some goals but don't don't set them so that you're you're on your knees at the end of the week you know consistency of the building block after the consistency be flexible with what you've given yourself uh, we said a lot in this podcast life gets in the way and the life has to get in the way of the plan that is what's meant to happen so what you write be prepared to change it and what I sort of I write my own plan and I give myself like right, I want to achieve these three things this week okay so these are the three sessions that I want to achieve I need to um, alongside that I need to do two hours of strength and conditioning and that's my gold standard of those five things need to be done within the week where they get done in the week depends on kids and life etc and then the other recovery the easy running that sort of slots in so that's a good way to think about it it's like right these are my key sessions i'm going to get done um and they're non um non-negotiable and then everything else is going to be sort of flexible where they happen in the week kind of can depend on on how your week goes and then my final thing would be to share the plan with your nearest and dearest or your running buddies give yourself a bit of accountability but also talk it through with perhaps your partner or your wife and say okay so I've, let, let's have a look at the um, spreadsheet I know the Martin Consanis do this because if I need to book Debs to go for a run she has to get the running spreadsheet out and where they've booked in all their runs but in order for you to be successful in your plan you need the support of your nearest and dearest so sharing what you're going to do how you're going to fit it in and like dave said earlier those recovery weeks are so important not just for your physical um, well-being getting yourself fitter but also because you can then be like darling i'll have the kids all this weekend don't worry about my training uh sneakily having a recovery weekend um so sharing what you're going to be doing so you can talk through planning so it doesn't then become you know this onerous oh the stress um but sort of building it in with the family so have a go at writing your plan definitely and think about that flexibility consistency and sharing way where, where you want to go and if you need any help you know where we are <laughs> how do you follow Top that? that dave Top <laughs> that. <laughs> well you've kind of with your 14 different one key tips um i've <laughs> so i went i wrote down this this is my one line i said don't forget to allow for life and Ed, eddie did i was obviously just sort of said that in there you have to be flexible once you've written it down that is not in no, concrete yeah you have to be prepared to change it because if you don't, if you keep flogging away with this plan and it's not the right thing at that moment, you don't need to be a coach to work out where that's going to lead. So, you know, things like things like illness and so on, you can use them to your advantage. It, it, you know, assume let's assume it's nothing too serious, heaven forbid, I'm not wishing that on anybody, but you know, if you have a niggle or if you've got a slight illness, you've got a bit of a cold or whatever, use it to your advantage okay, I've got some recovery time now, I'll use that, I could maybe do some extra strength and conditioning work this week, or something that's not going to impinge on your cold, 
but my legs are going to recover. Therefore, I can swap these other blocks around now. Okay, so I've brought that forward one week, so I can just change that one slightly. And before you know it, the plan will then have evolved again. And then three weeks later, something else will happen in life and you'll have to just tweak it a little bit again. But I think a lot of runners, once they've written down this plan, they feel that it has to be followed if you're going to get the best out of yourself. And that's not how it works. You've only got a certain amount of stress that your body can take. And some of that's going to come from running. Some of it's going to come from relationships. Some of it's going to come from work and numerous other things. And you've got to just keep balancing all those different stresses that have been put on your body. So at the end of it, you're still coming out strong. You're standing on that start line thinking, you know what? I dealt with everything I had to deal with you in this training cycle. I'm good to go. Excellent. This is brilliant. Thank you so much to, to both of you. I think there's so much uh, great advice there. And uh, if you're like me, I think there'll be people listening to this several times to sort of and taking notes and writing these things down. Because I think the thing which I've really appreciated both of you sharing tonight is this comes from a vast experience of your own running and also your coaching that you've done over the last number of years. So thank you so much for just sharing with us. And I say I will, I will put links to both your coaching on, uh, on, on the show notes. So if anybody wanted to contact you, uh, if they wanted, to, to, uh, that wanted to, to be coached, then uh, that opportunity is there as well. So thank you very much, guys. And uh, look forward to catching up with you again soon. Lovely. Cheers, John. Thanks, Eddie. Thanks, Dave. So we hope you enjoyed that interview with Eddie and Dave. And as Eddie said, we are going to try and get Dave back on regularly. And we may even do a question sort of time that you could pose questions and then we can pose those to him. We haven't asked Dave yet, so we need to, <laughs> <laughs> need to check All on right, that. All right, Dave, thanks for that. <laughs> yeah. So how was your, how was your week looking? Your, your children are finishing their half term and then they're well, back? Well, no, they're oh. not. They have another week of darn oh. half term. <laughs> um, so what I'm going to do is uh, I've, had a, I've carried on training this week because they've been quite busy with their different clubs this week. So I've carried on with a bit more training. And next week, I'm going to have an easier week, kind of enforced anyway, because because um, I've got childcare, darn children to look after. Um, so I'm going to have a quieter week next week anyway. And then the week after, I am, I am open to suggestions. Maybe as we're not going to do a competition this week, I should put something on Facebook with what should I do? Mm. I've been toying around in my mind. I need to finish this year because a couple of weeks after, um, a couple of weeks into November, we normally get snow. And so the, the high trails are then out of action until we can put on skis so this is that's the in a couple of weeks is sort of my last time that i can get a lot of running done i've done a hundred mile week as part of the centurion challenge i've done forty thousand feet in a week as part of a centurion challenge so i was thinking maybe i should do something hours wise that i would have run for the southbounds way 100 so maybe like i was aiming for between 17 and 18 hours so maybe that amount of training in a week here um i'm not going to run 100 miles on my own let's just put that out there now <laughs> because uh i don't want to <laughs> um so yeah i'm gonna have a little taper next week and then think of something big to do the week after to finish the block and see how i feel after my high volume attempt um see how the legs feel because i think I, I need that for a bit of closure and to feel like i've sort of you know done something for all this hard work so yeah what about you how are you going to recover well between yeah two races? that is part of the <laughs> part of the challenge you, should this we time. have a quick should we have a quick coaching conference now yeah i think so because um <laughs> I, 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 normally i would never ever do two races this close i don't i don't like yeah. to do this but it was yeah. just the opportunity to to have a run with you as well even though you've uh, oh, ditched me I know. <laughs> um but anyway so it, it, it will i've never done two races so close uh, so I'm, I must admit, I'm a little bit concerned about whether I've bitten off more than I can chew. Um, so the priority tomorrow is going to be to try and finish with enough in the legs that I'm not mm. absolutely mm. trashed. So mm. I am going to try and take it really steady all the way. Mm. And I, again, I don't normally like to do that. I, hate, I don't like using a race yeah. as a training run. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But uh, I am going to try and be a little bit more sensible on the one tomorrow. <laughs> I say that now, but we'll see. Um, so it'll depend a lot. And what I'm really hoping is that I recover within a day or two and I'm able to do some sort of walk-in 
not fully recovered, but feel as though I can feel as though I can. My legs are not completely trashed. Uh, yeah, um, yeah. And then maybe have one uh, sort of maybe a ten mile one next Saturday. Um, yeah. And then that, that so that, and then just a, a couple of easy runs. So I'll probably only run three times. I think. Yeah. Four at the yeah. most between the two races. Um, so a lot will depend on how I how, how I do tomorrow. What's the weather looking like tomorrow? Um, it looks dry but windy. Um, okay, so you're not going to get really cold. You're not going to get. I don't really think wet. so. No, the so, last couple, the last couple of years I've done it. It's been horrendous in the March. We had the beast from the east when I ran with Katrina, um, <gasps> and we and the race got stopped in the snow and the ice. It was freezing, and then last year it was almost worse. I felt because it was um, because you go in one direction. It was into the wind and the rain. Some of the photos are absolutely drenched, you know, and then now and again, when you went down into the valley, you got a bit of respite and then you climbed up again and you were back into it. And then I remember getting to Rock White Horse and you basically turn left then. And so I think, oh, we won't be quite into the wind. So the last 10 miles I was hoping would be an easier last 10 miles. But because it had been so wet, it was so muddy. And so, you know, I, and there I was slipping and sliding everywhere. And there's one little bit where you go down this little, little gully bit. And I slipped in this puddle and I sat in this puddle up to my waist. And I thought, Is, can anything else, can I get any wetter? <laughs> <laughs> this is a low this is a low it was point. it was definitely a low but it was okay. one of those ones where i just sat there and laughed because i thought this can't get any worse you know I'm, I'm drenched i was hoping this would be a bit easier the last 10 miles but it was actually just as hard uh, okay. but I got so there. it's not gonna we're not it's not gonna be like that tomorrow. No, you're gonna no. jog around i, I think it might great. be a bit wet underfoot though because it's been so wet over the last few days okay. so it might be a bit but a lot of it is on good hard pack um trail so it's only some that's in on the mud. So it'll be fine. I'm, I'm going to enjoy it. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So that will be, uh, that will be next week. And then we thought for next week's episode, we've got, there's two races. There's the Hardmost 55 and the South Downs Way 50. So Eddie, you're going to try and interview a couple of people who've done that, the uh, South Downs Way. And I'll interview a couple of people who've done the Hardmores race with, with me tomorrow. So that will be next week's episode. So I'm John Kiniston and this was episode 11. I'm Eddie Sutton and let's run to the hills.